1461. The Danube. Vlad Dracula puts pen to paper to tell his ally Matthias Corvinus, the king of Hungary, about how many he has killed attacking Ottoman territory. 23,884 Turks and Bulgarians in all, not including those who were burned in their houses and whose heads were not presented to our officials. But he also writes, this will lead to an all-out war with Mehmed. When the weather permits, that is to say in the spring, they will come with evil intentions and with all of their power. And when they did, Vlad would find himself fighting alone. Thanks so much to Raycon for helping keep history alive. Vlad's attack on Ottoman territory across the Danube River didn't just come out of nowhere. He knew that his brother Radu was still on the Ottoman court, just in case Vlad needed to be replaced, and he was aware of Mehmed's expansionist designs. Indeed, it was obvious to everyone an attack was coming, because a few years earlier, Pope Pius II and the Venetians had raised money in order to fund a crusade that would prevent further Ottoman expansion. But while Matthias Corvinus, Frederick III, and other rulers had taken the Pope's money, because, you know, free money, they were slow to actually do anything productive with it. Because while most European monarchs talked a big game about defending against the Muslim Turks, the reality was that for most kingdoms, their Christian neighbor states were a much more credible threat. In fact, in desperation, Pope Pius reached out to other Muslim states in hopes of convincing them to attack the Ottomans to keep Mehmed tied down. Plus, Vlad had his own border troubles, namely his cousin Stephen, who he'd helped put on the throne of Moldavia. But now Stephen had switched sides and became an Ottoman vassal, massing his troops on Vlad's borders so that if the Ottomans came, Vlad would have to fend off armies from two directions. That came to pass in 1462, when one night, Mehmed and Vlad's brother Radu led Ottoman forces across the Danube and into Wallachia. Vlad opposed him with a battery of cannons, but when the Ottomans raised their own artillery positions and began firing back, he withdrew. Vlad was simply outnumbered and outgunned. Mehmed had between 60 and 70,000 troops and 120 cannons, whereas Vlad could only muster 10,000 soldiers in his main force, most of which peasants, rather than professionals. Now a word of caution here. While we do know what happened in this war, there's still a debate about the location, order of events, and even what Vlad and Mehmed's strategic objectives were. Mehmed, for his part, probably didn't want to outright conquer Wallachia and bring it into the empire. It was more valuable, after all, as a buffer zone against Hungary, but of course with the more dependable Radu in charge rather than Vlad. Also, he was interested in Stephen helping him take back a Black Sea fortress. Whereas Vlad, of course, wanted to stay on the throne and expel Mehmed from his lands. But he did know he couldn't beat Mehmed in the field, so instead he used guerrilla tactics. He sent word for Wallachian civilians to flee to the Carpathian Mountains, then retreated, burning the land behind him and poisoning water sources to deny the Ottoman army food. Then his horsemen harried Mehmed's column, striking and disappearing, occasionally taking captives, waiting for a moment to land a hard blow. Which came when the Ottoman army camped outside of the capital of Targovishta, not noticing that spies passed in their midst. According to folklore, one of those spies was in fact Vlad himself, using his command of Turkish to pass himself off as a soldier. And whether true or not, the scouts learned what they needed to know, the location of Mehmed's tent. Wallachian cavalry screamed into the unaware Ottoman force, slashing down with swords and burning canvas tents, killing hundreds in the shock assault before many in the Ottoman camp could even pick up weapons. And Vlad stormed through the melee, slicing his way into Mehmed's personal tent to find it empty. Mehmed happened to be somewhere else. Vlad called a retreat. His planned decapitation strike had failed. The next day, the armies finally met in earnest, where Vlad lost 2,000 soldiers and abandoned the capital to Mehmed, running with his shattered army for the safety of the mountains. But he left something behind. As Mehmed and Radu approached Targobishta, their troops saw what from a distance looked like a stand of trees. That is, until they got closer. They were bodies. Ottoman captives from Vlad's depredations along the Danube, and the soldiers he'd snatched during the guerrilla campaign. Men, women, children, all impaled in a macabre display with birds nesting in their corpses. One account puts the number at 20,000, roughly the amount Vlad himself had claimed to kill in his letter to Matthias Corvinus. But while this terror tactic did shake the approaching Ottoman troops, it actually opened another avenue for Mehmed. He had, after all, brought his favorite Radu the Handsome to replace Vlad, 
and Vlad's long-standing campaigns of public cruelty and his war on the Boyars had not exactly endeared him to what was left of Wallachian nobility. So with Vlad on the run, clearly defeated, Boyars increasingly defected to Radu. The new prince, now enthroned at Targovishta, quickly reached out to elements Vlad had clashed with, like the Transylvanian Saxons. A great warrior he was perhaps not, but he was a cunning enough diplomat to offer himself as a more reasonable alternative to his vicious brother, even if he was an Ottoman puppet. Vlad was defeated, out of power, his troops likely deserting in increasing numbers. The only upside was that his fortress on the Black Sea had withstood a siege by both Stephen and Mehmed, but that was cold comfort. And within weeks, Vlad's support had melted to the point that Mehmed went home, leaving Radu to run things secure on his new throne. Now hiding in the Carpathian Mountains, Vlad had but one hope. See, there was rumors that his old ally, Matthias Corvinus, was marching toward Wallachia with a Hungarian army. So Vlad dispatched messages begging for aid in regaining his throne. And Corvinus came with a pair of shackles. See, Corvinus didn't necessarily want to battle Mehmed at that moment, but the Pope and Venetians had, after all, given him all that nice money to fight the Ottomans with, and it just seemed like such a waste to use it fighting the Ottomans, you know? But he did have to show he'd done something, so he arrested Vlad, producing several forged letters to prove that Vlad had been collaborating with Mehmed, offering to make war on Hungary in exchange for regaining his throne. And no, it doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, even Corvinus' court historian seems to think it was a little thin. But Corvinus needed to show the Pope a victory, and uncovering Vlad's treachery was a way to do that without expending his military. So Vlad was a prisoner once again, and would remain one for 14 years. We have little documentation on Vlad during this period, apart from the fact that he was held for a few years and then allowed to settle in a house in Pest, transitioning from being strictly a prisoner to more of an exiled noble forbidden from leaving the country. Though among the few stories we have about him during this time is one violent incident involving Hungarian troops. Apparently, a thief had run and hid in Vlad's home, and then when a squad of troops burst in to pursue him, Vlad had their leader executed on the spot. He'd argued, successfully, that he was within his rights because the troops had not asked for an invitation. Meanwhile, as Vlad stewed, causing a few diplomatic incidents in Pest, Radu lost the throne to another rival, and when the news hit a clearly restless Vlad, he pushed Corvinus to give him an army to recover Wallachia. Because remember, according to Corvinus, Vlad was still the legitimate prince, and Vlad argued he could be useful. But while Corvinus still refused for years to support Vlad, he did increasingly give his pet Wallachian prince a longer and longer leash, letting him move around within Hungary and settle in Transylvania, giving him clearance to gather followers around him. Staging Vlad across the border, exactly like all those pretenders had done during Vlad's rule, Corvinus was testing Dracula, seeing if he could trust him. And in 1476, the biggest test came, when he sent Vlad along on military expeditions against the Ottomans in Bosnia and to bail Vlad's cousin Stephen out when his relationship with Mehmed soured and the Sultan invaded Moldavia, though it was only a prelude. Within months, a Hungarian army was marching on Targovishta, and Vlad and Stephen, armies now united, barely missed capturing the deposed prince as he fled to Mehmed. So in November 1476, Vlad once again became the Prince of Wallachia. In his life, he'd been a hostage, a fugitive exile, a prince, a captive, a general, and both a rebel and an oppressor. He'd carried his sword for the Ottomans, Hungarians, Moldavians, a pope, and a sultan. Now in his mid-forties, it would be his third reign as prince. And though it would only last two months, Vlad would live forever. Whew, eternal life sounds like it could take a while. Good thing we can listen to a ton of podcasts and music in the meantime, thanks to our everyday earbuds from Raycon. While I've been going wireless for a while now, Jeff has been meaning to jump on the earbud bandwagon for a bit, and the wireless everyday earbuds are a perfect entry point. I like them because they come with a bunch of different gel tips, so I could find a super comfy fit for my weird ear shape, and Jeff really enjoys their low form factor because they don't stick out of his ears like an old-timey sci-fi movie. Plus, they have a 32-hour battery life, which is great on the go. They stay in your ears no matter what babies or cats try to do to you, and they start at half the price of other premium earbuds while still sounding great. So whether you're listening to history and RPG podcasts like us, or want to vibe out with your favorite YouTube channels, Raycon's got you covered. 
And if for some wild reason, the testimonials of cartoons on the internet aren't enough for you, Raycon also offers a free 45-day happiness guarantee. So you can be sure you love your everyday earbuds. And right now, Raycon has a special offer for all you fine folks. Just click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash extra credits and you'll get 15% off your Raycon purchase. So not only will you be saving some cash while joining Jeff in the wireless revolution, you'll also be supporting our channel in the process, which we cannot thank you for enough. Thanks again. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons.